my pleasure to introduce Emmett Shear, the CEO of Twitch, currently at Amazon subsidiary, and uh, also one of the original members, uh, along with Steve, of the first Y Combinator class. So um, these guys have been, been at this for now 11 years, <laughs> which is pretty crazy. And I thought Daniel was going to come up here again, but I don't know where he is. So uh, do I start by... I, should I just talk? Yeah, you should start right, talking. Tell us, talk. tell us your story, and then we'll get Daniel up here when he gets right. back. Sounds good. Um, so, uh, hi, everybody. I, uh, I started my first startup with Justin right outside, uh, uh, right after college. We, we did Y Combinator with Steve. Uh, I remember the first time I met Steve, I told him, I told him something really stupid uh, about databases that was not true. And uh, uh, he thought I was an idiot, but we, we got over it. And uh, my first startup was really bad. Um, I think a lot of people have a learner startup. Um, Drew started Dropbox, uh, Drew Houston. He, and he, uh, his first startup was like an SAT prep startup. It was not, not as successful as Dropbox. Um, right? Uh, Microsoft originally, uh, Bill Gates started the startup. Uh, I think it's what's called like Trafo Data also not as successful as Microsoft. So I think one of the things I learned from my first startup, which is a, a calendar startup, is that uh, it takes a long time to, uh, to figure out what you're doing. And it's OK if your first thing doesn't work. Um, so we, we started our calendar startup right after college. And uh, it was uh, basically a disaster. We went from one, uh, we just didn't talk to any users. We, did, we spent the entire time working on features that we thought would be cool. And we never actually went and talked to anybody who used calendars. Um, so it was a very, it was a, thinking back on it, it's like one of the more embarrassing uh, startup stories because we did basically everything wrong, uh, but we we did make a lot of progress in the sense that we like we wrote a lot of features. We actually the two of us built Google Calendar uh, before Google Calendar was released in like 12 months, uh, and then we beat Google to launching it somehow, despite the fact that they had like 10 times as many engineers. And those engineers were clearly vastly more qualified than either of us was to build a web app, since we'd never done it before. Uh, and so we did a lot of building of stuff. Uh, it just wasn't something that turned into an actual business. Um, and we had sort of ADD during it, too. This is another thing you shouldn't do uh, when you're starting a company, if you want to start a company, which is uh, while you're working on the first company, when it doesn't immediately become an overnight success, get distracted and go build something else. So while we were building this web calendar, we also built a social network for families. Uh, it was called youlookfamiliar.com, which I thought was a very clever name. Uh, a search engine for MySpace. Uh, this website called soundzap.com. That was, if, if you know SoundCloud now, it was basically like very similar to Sound, SoundCloud, except that when we launched it, we didn't immediately get traction within 48 hours, and so we turned it off. Um, it, so there's sort of a pattern to us building these things and then uh, not really thinking about how we were going to get users, who we were going to use them. Um, but we got really good at building stuff. And actually, that, that turned out to be really valuable because uh, the, one of the hardest and most important things to do in a startup is to actually go build stuff uh, and get it out there and build reasonably qu good quality stuff pretty quickly. So uh, eventually, Google released Google Calendar. And, uh, and that was kind of like the death blow for Kiko, our calendar startup, because we had no plan for how to deal with them launching Google Calendar, even though it had obviously been coming for the past like three years. So. Uh, so what we did was, really just the past two years, I guess. Um, so what we did was we kept going for a little bit, and then we sold it on eBay, um, which was another thing I don't recommend you do. Uh, it was fun for us. We got a lot of press about it because we were the only people who had done it, uh, uh, which sort of feeds into a point about marketing, which is that ridiculous stunts can totally get you press. Uh, but they only work in, if you're the first person to do them. So you have to go do something else outrageous if you want to sell your company uh, like you should sell it via Snapchat or something today. That would be the, like, the, the equivalent thing to do if you were trying to dispose of a startup quickly. Uh, so then we, we were stuck in, uh, in Boston and trying to figure out what to do next. Uh, and I remember the car ride where we were having this conversation, I think it was about Yahoo and how Yahoo needed to come up with a new strategy because they were, seemed a little rudderless, which seems to be a theme. You know, 10 years later, yes, that conversation is still highly relevant. Um, and. Uh, we were like, people would be very interested in to hear our thoughts because we were 23. Because everyone wants to hear 23-year-olds who have never done anything's thoughts on st corporate strategy. 
uh, we should like broadcast on this, this on the internet. People would be interested in this. Um, and that turned into the idea that Justin had, I should just record all of my conversations so I can just upload them because that'll be easy. Uh, it'll be easier that way. Which turned into, why don't we just stream all of our conversations live as they're happening? Which turned into, why don't we just stream, well, this is Justin's idea because only Justin would take this this far. Why don't we stream Justin's life uh, just like as 24-7 all the time? That's a good idea. We should, we should do this. And, oh, that was sort of a joke. I don't, I don't think we actually were, we weren't too serious about it. Um, we went to this party uh, and we were telling people about this great new startup idea we had because we had a great new startup idea every like 48 hours. And uh, Chuck Foreman, the guy who started, he uh, was the founder of OMG Pop. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember Draw Something. Uh, you might be too young. That's scary. Um, told, told Justin, uh, I think it was, uh, you're full of crap and you're never ever going to do this, uh, which was probably the wrong thing to say because that turned into us actually starting uh, Justin TV. Um, and so we went back, we raised money for it. God only knows why people, I mean, actually I know why people uh, put money into Justin TV because I was giving this talk at Y Combinator and I asked the audience why, because we had a bunch of people who had angel invested in our company who were in the audience, why did you invest? And literally the universal answer was, it just seems so ridiculous and I thought it would be funny. And I wanted to see what would happen. <laughs> Again, I don't recommend this as a fundraising strategy for your startup, it worked for us, but we were doing something kind of absurd. Um, which I don't know, maybe that's, a, maybe that's its own strategy that's underexploited. So, uh, so we started Justin TV, uh, which is a live streaming startup. Wait, real quick, I'm gonna pause. Questions? Anyone have any questions? I've given this talk a lot of times, so I like, can kind of go into autopilot. It'd be more interesting if you have any questions about anything I've said. No? All right, start thinking about them for the next time I ask. Um, so we started Justin TV. The idea was we were gonna make a live reality television show uh, on the internet. How many people, show of hands, how many people here watched Justin TV, like the original show, know what I was talking about? My friends, okay, good. Uh, before everyone else's time. So the idea was literally Justin's life live 24 seven on the internet. Um, it turns out reality television is fun and interesting to the degree that it is fun and interesting, solely because of editing. Like they, they take weeks of content and they turn it into like an hour of show. We had weeks of content in weeks of time. This, this is not a winning play for like interesting television. Like literally eight hours a day of the show was Justin sleeping. And like even though this interesting person is only interesting an hour, two hours a day, most of the time they're doing something boring. They're reading, they're, they're like in a car going somewhere. Um, and so uh, we got a ton of press because it was a ridiculous stunt, but we, it was, press is like not a sustainable way to grow your startup. If you're ever thinking about how should I grow my startup, and you're like, oh, I know, I'll get like the press to write stories about us. No, bad startup founder. <laughs> that is not how you get uh, users for your startup. Um, press feels good because like your mom's gonna read that story and she's like, oh, I saw you in the newspaper. And you're like, yeah, I'm succeeding. You're not succeeding. Like we got so much press and Justin TV really didn't work. Um, and it didn't work because we hadn't actually made anything people wanted. Like nobody actually wanted to watch Justin's life on the internet except our friends who thought it was hilarious. Uh, and so uh, we pivoted and we, we decided that we built a bunch of technology uh, to do this show. And we got a bunch of inbound interest from our users saying, hey, I want to run a show too. Um, and so we took the technology we built to do the Justin TV live streaming show and we, uh, we broke it up uh, into something that anyone could use. And that was much more successful. Justin TV uh, as a platform for streaming, uh, for anyone to stream, did much better. Um, sort of for the same reason YouTube did, which was that there was this huge latent demand for people to stream video content in an easy way that just wasn't met by, uh, by existing technology. Um, and that led to a long period of us learning how to scale things. So we, we were growing pretty fast. Like we were growing 30, 40% a month, which is great. Like if you can sustain a growth rate like that, you get pretty big pretty fast. And every single Saturday morning was oh God, the European soccer game is on. Uh, our website is breaking from people trying to find it. Um, and so we would, uh, we basically had this just constant cycle of not being good enough engineers and having to uh, shore up the cracks in the, the shoddy system we'd built uh, to get us to that next point up. And that was, a, that was a really actually 
great learning experience because we got pretty good at it by the end. By the end of it, we actually knew what we were doing, kind of, um, and we could scale and build uh, a website that, you know, I think it was peak 50 million people around the world were using, um, which is great. That was a, that was a really amazing opportunity. Any, any questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, so okay, some stories from Justin, the Justin TV days. My favorite Justin TV memory is uh, we were all playing poker and there was this fan uh, whose internet handle was Gentle Giant Jeff, who was just this huge, huge guy who was really into Justin. And uh, he had been hanging out with us, it was cool, uh, and uh, but we wanted to have some time like with just sort of the closer inner circle of friends. Uh, and so we sort of all went upstairs and left the people we'd been hanging out with that day behind um, and went, went to our apartment building and we were playing poker and Justin goes down, uh, goes downstairs to, uh, to get some beer and bring it back up for the poker game and he walks out of the, uh, walks out of the, the poker room and calls up the elevator and you, we're watching, of course, because what do you do when Justin leaves the room is you immediately pull him up on your laptop and start watching Justin leave the room. Uh, sort of like the Truman Show or something. Um, and the, the elevator doors open, and, there, and Justin walks in, and he sort of turns, and there's gentle giant Jeff staring down at him. And the elevator door is shut, and the feed just like cuts like a horror movie. <laughs> Um, and, uh, uh, and we all are afraid that Gentle Giant Jeff has just killed our friend. Uh, but no, actually, he was fine. He, he just wanted to say hi. Uh, and, then, and then he left, and it was, it was cool. But uh, that, was, that was one of my favorite moments. Um, another one of my less favorite, favorite moments, but uh, quite memorable, was uh, we, were, we were all just hanging out, uh, working on the website, hanging out in our apartment, and we hear a knock on the door, bang, 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 open up, it's the police. Our friends are kind of trolls, so we assume, uh, I think actually we assumed it was Brezina. We, assume, we assumed Matt Brezina was like claiming to be the police knocking on our door, go away Brezina. And then they, they like knocking gets louder um, and uh, we open the door and it is in fact the police with guns drawn uh, coming into our apartment, looking very confused because they were expecting something different than a bunch of programmers in their underwear. Like, <laughs> sitting at computers. They, to the police's credit, they pretty rapidly figured out that like, there was not in fact a knifing in our apartment. No matter what the guy talking to them over the, uh, the text-to-speech engine they have for deaf people, uh, who called himself Magic, was telling them there was not in fact a knifing going on in our apartment. Um, so we, we got swatted pretty bad there, um, which is actually pretty horrible. Like, I don't know if anyone here knows about swatting, but it's this thing where you call the police on, uh, on people uh, as a form of like, I guess, it's like a prank. It's a prank that sometimes gets people killed, so like not, not really that awesome. Um, and uh, we got really actually paranoid about sort of like operational security. We didn't want to let people know where we were a lot. Uh, so it was kind of awkward with a 24-7 live television show. It's really hard to prevent people from figuring out where you are. Um, those are, my, those are I think, are my two favorite stories. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, actually. Because so, we started off with such a ridiculous idea, like this is a 24-7 stream of someone's life, that I, I, my, I think my baseline for shock was pretty high. Um, I think the, uh, probably the weirdest thing uh, was when uh, uh, Stefan Marbury, the NBA player, maybe also before everyone's time, I don't know, uh, <laughs> uh, started live streaming on Justin TV. And went slowly insane on camera. Uh, wound up like eating Vaseline out of a jar and like ranting about the, like, the government. It was, it was like, it was not what I expected. I was like, oh right, we have the, an NBA player. This is awesome. We're getting real celebrities to use our platform. And then, yeah, it went, it went south real fast. Um, it turns out the kind of people who want to stream their lives like eight hours at a time and nothing else 
might be a little mentally unstable sometimes. Yeah. Oh yeah, Twitch plays Pokemon. What did I think about Twitch plays Pokemon? Um, Can you explain what that is? Yeah, yeah. So Twitch plays Pokemon uh, actually was maybe one of the weirdest experiences. I didn't, I didn't think of that, but it's probably one of the weirdest experiences. It certainly was very unexpected. Someone hooked up a Game Boy emulator to the chat room and then broadcast that emulator live. So you could say in the chat room up, and it would press the button up in the emulator, and then the character would go up or A or B. Um, and so you had this giant war of like you know thousands of people all trying to play Pokemon at the same time, um, which was uh, actually pretty amusing to watch because the character looked like it, he had like Parkinson's disease or something. He's jittering up and down. Is that is that is that on oh, a PC? I'm sorry. Um, so uh, uh, anyways, it spawned this whole like religion around the Helix fossil and the creator, and uh, people got really into it, um, and. Uh, uh, when I first walked into that chat room and saw Twitch Plus Pokemon going on, I, I, I think my major reaction was just like, that is so clever. Like, the, I, we'd never thought of, we'd been running this platform for years, and we'd never thought of hooking up chat directly into a feedback mechanism with the video system, so you'd actually have like the, that closed loop. Um, it's sort of like a, it's sort of like putting a camera at the screen the camera's being projected onto, right? You get this, this weird feedback loop that produces all kinds of funny visuals. Um, and that was sort of what, it, it was like that, but with a video game. It was awesome. I don't know. I don't have anything else to say about it. It was really cool. I think that answers the question. All right. So uh, we kind of lucked into Justin TV because we'd done something that was generally a good idea for startups, which is we built something for ourselves. We built this technology for us to use to make the Justin TV show. And then it turns out when you build something that you really want to accomplish something you want to do, a lot of other people often want to use that same thing as well. Um, but because we built it for ourselves, we hadn't really figured out how to build stuff for other people on purpose. We just had built stuff for us, and then it happened to be other people wanted it, which is how a lot of really great things get built. Um, but you then have to make the transition eventually, as you're not the primary user anymore, to figuring out what those other people need and building for them. Um, and we really had trouble with that at Justin TV um, because we still used the uh, think hard about what the end user is like and then try to guess what they might want school of product development, which I do not recommend. Um, and so we, uh, we built a bunch of features no one wanted and never really talked to our broadcasters about what their needs were. And so Justin TV got to a certain size and it kind of plateaued because we weren't making product improvements that mattered anymore. Uh, and so we got to around 50 million monthly users and we couldn't figure out where to go from there. Like we'd run out of ideas. We were, we were this is actually the moment, this is how you know it's time to pivot your company is when you try to think of clever things you could do, and you try to think of what should we do from here, and you literally come up dry. There aren't like, because normally when you're working on a startup, you have this list of things you want to build that's 100 times longer than you'll ever manage to get to. At the point where you're like, I don't, can't see anything that's going to push us forward, I can't see how we grow from here, that's when you, it's time to maybe change your strategy significantly. So we had a internal debate about whether, what we should do next. Um, and uh, I thought we should do video games because mostly, mostly honestly, because I really liked video games and I watched video games on Justin TV. It was my the only content I watched on Justin TV, and because I uh, I felt that uh, video games were this big untapped space. There wasn't anyone else doing it, and I knew that the content was exciting at least to me. I. Uh, on the other hand, uh, my co-founders thought that mobile was going to be really big. Uh, they had this idea that the iPhone was really exciting. The iPhone had just recently come out. Um, and that this whole iPhone and Android thing was going to be really big. Like, even bigger than people thought. Uh, and we should invest there. Um, it turns out, of course, they were right. Um, and I was right. Uh, and uh, we actually did something really interesting, which I also wouldn't recommend. God, I might, our history is full of these don't recommend things. Um, but uh, we, we split the company. So the former CEO, Michael Seibel, uh, went and uh, with the spinoff and started Social Cam, which was kind of like Instagram for video, except for Instagram now has video. But like, imagine Instagram and only video, and that would be Social Cam. And uh, I took the remaining company uh, and sort of pivoted it to focus on video, uh, video games, 
uh, using the same technology we used before, and that became Twitch. Uh, and Justin uh, wound up leaving to go start Exec uh, with his brother, uh, Daniel, who you heard from earlier, um, and Kyle, uh, who Daniel then wound up working, it's so incestuous too, um, wound up uh, wound up leaving shortly thereafter. He ran Justin TV for us for a little bit, and then wound up leaving to start his own thing, uh, which turned out to be a good idea. Um, and uh, what was what, that, thing called? that thing was called Cruise. Um, after a little while, um, which he started with Daniel, which uh, who you heard from earlier today. Um, so anyway, uh, let me see. Any questions? <laughs> yes, Steve. I have a question. So when you guys split and the person sold the cat, there was like a few months before the whole thing went off, right? Like a while. Yeah, six months. Yeah, so when we, were, uh, when we were trying to decide what to do next, we actually set it up as a competition deliberately, where we had one, little t one team working on social cam and another team working on Twitch. It wasn't called Twitch at the time, but gaming. Uh, and we sort of set, uh, we set a bar each of the groups had to pass. Um, and uh, sort of a growth rate we were targeting for each group with the idea that uh, we would pivot the company to do whichever team met its growth rate. So it's sort of your project was on the line. If you didn't, if your project didn't hit its growth curve, we were going to kill it. Um, actually, Social Cam didn't hit its growth curve, but uh, that's probably because mobile development takes a lot longer than we expected it to. And we didn't actually get it out into the market until three months after we'd hoped to. Um, but, uh, but it was very competitive internally. It was very much, uh, can I prove that my project is, is the right pivot, the right direction for the company? Um, it's actually pretty healthy, I think. I think it's, uh, people are flee from competition, but I think if you, know, if you set it up in a friendly way, it's good. So, if you haven't sold it for a year, but social cam sold for six months or something, when it sold, did you guys just switch on the trajectory or were you thought it was too big to do it, or were you kind of like, yeah, it's fucking working? Yeah. So. Yeah, so uh, after social cam spun off, it sold, it did, it, they went through Y Combinator, uh, and they, they went through the Y Combinator program, and then three months later, I think, they sold to Autodesk. It was really quick. And uh, for $60 million too, which I thought was really a really, really good price uh, for Social Cam at the time. And uh, yeah, I remember at the moment, Twitch was doing well, like we were continuing to grow. And I thought someday we might build something that's actually worth, you know, was, was worth as, as much as Social Cam. Uh, but, uh, it felt really good to have that like that win in your pocket because I'd been working in startups for like at that point seven years and never really made any money um, and so seven years later uh, it really felt like oh we finally did it we finally like made some money after seven years of working 80 hour weeks uh, we've got somewhere um, so that was that was really good and it did feel like we de-risked it because Twitch still felt super risky at the time um, I think most most startups feel really really risky right up until they were an overnight success and everyone knew it all along. Um, that's, that's the usual pattern. And, and what was that for Twitch that happened before the acquisition? Was there a moment where you realized, we're golden, baby? Um, the tipping point for Twitch, where we realized that we were an overnight success as opposed to uh, imminent failure, uh, was we got onto the Xbox and PlayStation. Uh, we got apps on those for broadcasting. Now those apps weren't actually that important. They, they've never, I mean, they're, they're good apps. They've gotten a lot of usage. They didn't turn out to be core to our strategy, but they totally shifted public perception of Twitch. When we released them, suddenly all the VCs, all the business partners, uh, employees had this vision of us as, oh, wow, they're like a real company. They've, they're not just like some internet streaming platform. They're like, they have integrations in the, the leading uh, console platforms. And that public perception shift suddenly took us from it's super hard to raise money, no one wants to invest, uh, like to, oh my God, Twitch is amazing, we're growing so fast, we're the hot new thing, uh, can I put money into your startup? Um, it's a lot easier to raise money when you have that perception on your side. Um, and I think it was sort of a morale booster internally as well, it felt like we'd finally, we, we'd finally built something that was gonna be hard for anyone to take away from us without a lot of, a lot of effort.
Yeah, that's a good question. How do we, because we have, there's a tension between Twitch and video games in that to some degree, if you're watching people play video games, you're not actually playing them yourself. Um, we find, statistically speaking, that people who play Twitch, watch, who watch Twitch play more video games on average, not less. Um, it's possible still that that's, uh, that's just because we're selecting super, uh, super engaged gamers and they still play less than they would have otherwise. But uh, we compare Twitch users to other super engaged gamers and Twitch users still play more. So to some degree, I think it's an illusion. Uh, it seems to be that the more you engage with video games, the more you engage with video games sort of builds on itself. Like people who watch basketball on TV are probably more likely to play uh, rather than less likely to play. But uh, strategically, we just try to make sure that from a game company's point of view, Twitch draw, drives marketing value to that game company. It's actually really important to us. It's part of, part of a, sort of how Twitch can exist. Yeah, what, how, how did I choose video games? So I, we literally, in theory, we did this like rational process of looking through all the categories of content on Justin TV and like creating this like matrix of, you know, growth potential and current size and, you know, licensing costs and all kinds of other, uh, other things. And then, uh, and then we should have picked the one that was the best, but actually what happened was I liked watching the video game content and I could do enough math to justify it as like, this isn't a stupid idea, right? I could prove that there, there were a lot of people who played video games, there were a lot of people who watched video game videos on YouTube. This seems like it could be a thing. And also, I like this content and I believe in it. Um, and that was the act, like that's how we actually made the decision. Like I just thought it, it's, it seemed like I liked that content so much and I didn't think I was so weird. Um, I just thought people didn't know about it yet. Yeah. So like uh, something we something we skipped when we were considering the pivots. Yeah. Um, we thought a lot about going the enterprise route. Um, we built technology that very clearly people paid a lot of money for uh, for events like this. You have you have, maybe not this event literally, but corporate events where you have speakers and or you have all hands and people pay a lot of money to get good broadcasting and interaction software around that. Um, and none of us wanted to build enterprise software, so we like just didn't do that. Um, uh, economically, it might have been a good path, but it, we didn't really, we didn't consider it as really actually all that seriously, even though we did look at it. Yeah. What were the maybe significant challenges of bringing video from Korea? Do you think that the infrastructure was in place to do high quality yeah. video, or was it kind of like the best time or the early stages of having that infrastructure? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, what were the big technical challenges, and were, were, were we just at like the right time, or? In to, to start doing quality streaming. So the biggest technical challenge in doing video streaming um, is that the inter you have this model in your head if you know about programming and programming on the internet that the internet's this like nice homogenous network where you just say, I want to deliver these bytes from this location to this person and then it just happens and you don't have to think about it too hard. In reality, the internet's this like extremely complex, extremely heterogeneous, extremely like mixed network, some of which is extremely reliable and fast some of which is slow, most of which is broken in some way or doesn't talk to the rest of it. And so making the video system smart about how that network works, making the video system smart about, oh, this particular piece of connectivity is broken, we need to move over here instead, uh, that was probably the most technically difficult piece. Um, zooming back a little bit, uh, we were really lucky in our timing from one perspective. like. Uh, video quality had just gotten good enough that watching video games over the internet was possible because video games require a certain high level of resolution before they're really watchable, otherwise you just can't tell what's going on. Uh, but on the other hand, we've been hanging out doing live video on the internet before that happened for about four and a half years. So from one perspective, we had great timing. From another perspective, we were four and a half years early and we just managed to hang on long enough that it became possible. I think that's, that's actually very common. You, you arrive early and then you just hope you don't die before it becomes possible. Because um, you're usually a little ahead of the curve on a startup. Yeah. Uh, what was the initial reaction to Bob Ross's music? Or was it, was it different from like, the top end of video games? 
Yeah. Uh, so we, if it, does everyone here know about the Bob Ross thing? Show of hands, people, have people seen Bob Ross on Twitch? Yeah, only, only a few of you. Okay, so uh, we, uh, we had Bob Ross, the, the painter from the 80s, who had a, a public broadcasting program where he would, uh, he would paint landscapes and teach people how to do that. And we had, we had that, we got that licensed and we had Bob Ross on Twitch, uh, a marathon of all the Bob Ross uh, video ever. And it was extremely, extremely successful. Got, wound up getting like the equivalent of, I think, two or three Nielsen points um, for the duration of the week, which is like, you know, two to three percent of American television viewership. It's like huge. Um, we, we got a ton of viewership um, and people really liked it. Uh, and it sort of jump started this creative community we've been building on Twitch where we had a bunch of demand from our game streamers to th do other stuff on Twitch. They wanted to paint, they wanted to do cosplay, they wanted to uh, do illustrations, do sculpture. And originally it was around gaming. They wanted to do you know, paintings of StarCraft characters, paintings of League of Legends characters. But once we started allowing that, they started wanting to paint other stuff too. And we were faced with this, this decision, do we allow that, considering our mission's always been about gaming, or do we, uh, do we stomp, stomp it down and say, no, no, that's not for Twitch, take that elsewhere. And uh, we decided that when your users come to you and they really, really tell you you want to do it and they start producing cool stuff that other people want to see, you're, you're an idiot if you say no to them. So we're going we're gonna to see where it goes. It's kind of an experiment. Doesn't that bring us right back to Justin TV? Doesn't that bring us right back to Justin TV? Uh, eventually, yeah. That, I, I, think, I think it will. I think, I think actually there's a good chance that Twitch winds up turning into a generic live streaming platform that's just a much better generic live streaming platform that's specialized for every single use case um, in the very long run. But uh, we're not in a hurry to get there. We'll, we'll get there if we get pushed there by our users, but we won't, we won't go seeking it on purpose. <laughs> if we ever do get there, will I change the name back? Almost certainly not. Um, rarely do you go backwards. We might go forwards. I could, maybe we change our name, Twitch becomes the gaming subsection, but uh, even that seems unlikely, to be honest. Building a brand is really expensive and hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how important are esports? Esports are super important for us. Um, esports is one of the main ways people find out about video game streaming. It's very uh, uh, mediagenic. Uh, so you get lots and lots of media stories written about it. You get lots of uh, news articles. Uh, it shows up on ESPN. Um, but what you actually see in terms of user behavior is that while they show up originally to watch esports, and some people just, that's all they do and then they leave, large numbers of our users showed up to watch an esport and then stayed to watch the community content. Um, so we really see it as a marketing outlet for us. It's a great way to get new people informed about video game streaming. How much time do I have? I have no idea. All right. Any, any ten minutes? All right, great. Um, yeah. Absolutely. We actually have a whole new initiative we're launching at Twitch. We call Stream First uh, Gaming. So we're working with developers to create streaming first video games. These are video games that uh, from the ground up, right from the design stage up, are conceptualized like Twitch Plays Pokemon to be interactive with an audience when being broadcast. And we're really excited about it. Uh, it's obviously very early days on that because it, we've only sort of seen jury-rigged jury old games that were sort of tried to tr be turned into stream-first games. Uh, and we think there's this huge potential to build a video game that has streaming thought of from the first minute. And uh, so we have a whole program we're running around that. We just gave a couple talks at GDC about it. Um, and I'm really excited. To, I mean, I, if you guys are thinking about building video games, I recommend a stream-first video game. I think it's going to be the future. Um, you know, sort of single player, multiplayer, and then this is sort of a new kind of multiplayer uh, where you can have a mass audience of viewers as well. Um, so yeah, we are very excited about that. It's sort of directly inspired by Twitch Plays Pokemon.
Yeah, so I think that's a, that's a really hard question, actually, is when do, you, when do you listen to your users and when don't you? Um, generally speaking, the rule of thumb, I think, is you listen to your users' needs and what, what they want to get done, not their ideas for how to accomplish it. Uh, because uh, if your users are really good at coming up with product ideas, they would be running the company. Uh, they probably aren't actually good at that. You think about this all day, every day, you're probably better at it. Um, what they do know, way better than you do, is what they need and what their experience of your product is. And so you need to get that knowledge from them into your brain and you need to believe it. Even if it sounds silly, you need to believe it 100% that, that that is their experience of your product, that is their need. Um, and then you need to solve for it, right? So when Facebook users are saying they want a dislike button, um, you know, it's probably not that they want a dislike button per se. Uh, it's probably that they have some other need that, they need that, they, that needs to be fulfilled. Like, I don't like seeing all these stories in my feed that uh, I'm not interested in. And maybe you can solve for that in some other way that's better than a dislike button. Um, a good example of this at Twitch is early on, we were, uh, we were inundated with complaints that your video quality is not high enough. And we were like, that's weird. Uh, tell us more. And we just see constant complaints from broadcasters that uh, when they broadcast on Twitch, no matter how high they set their bit rate, people kept telling them the video quality was bad. Um, it turns out what was happening is they would set their bit rate as high as they could to get the highest quality video they could, and that would mean that viewers with crappy internet connections couldn't watch because the, uh, the bit rate was too high and they couldn't download it fast enough. And so their video would be all choppy and, and broken up. The solution actually was to downgrade the quality of the video. We built a system that uh, that re-encoded the video at a lower bit rate and lower quality. And then the people with the slow internet connections could watch it just fine. And the complaints about the low quality video went away because we lowered the video quality. Um, this, is, this is actually super common, right? The users are gonna tell you, hey, you need to, we need to broadcast at higher quality. But that's not actually what they mean. They mean they want a better quality viewer experience and you have to figure out what that actually means and the best way to accomplish it. Um, Talking to your users is critical, not a substitute for the hard thinking you have to do afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, VR is really, really a really interesting question. Um, you can't stream VR in any meaningful sense. Um, you can have the equivalent of, of an observer mode in VR where you can join someone else's game and have a game client running and render the game yourself. But if you think about how it works, uh, the way Twitch works is we capture someone's point of view and then stream it to you. That's the whole sort of concept of video game streaming. If you try to do that in VR, you're gonna get really motion sick because you're gonna capture their head movement and it's gonna be counter to your own. And that's gonna be a really unpleasant experience. So. You can't just translate the Twitch experience one-to-one -to, -one to VR. Um, I do think that Twitch shows there's a huge demand for people to join in on other people's gameplay in an observer capacity. Um, I think it's gonna have to be built directly into the games themselves, and we're still trying to figure out how Twitch can contribute to that. Yeah. I, I watch a lot of Hearthstone. I also play a lot of Hearthstone. It, it, is, it is absolutely true. I, I took the CEO of Blizzard 2-1 in a heated match uh, of Hearthstone Tavern Brawl uh, at the last year's TwitchCon. It was pretty awesome. I felt good about that. Yeah, so subscriptions were an idea that actually came from one of our broadcasters. We had this broadcaster at Day9, and he said to us, basically, I have all these fans who want to support me, and they keep asking for things that I can't give everyone. Like, I want to, they want to play video games with me, but I can't play video games with 500 people at once. Uh, so I want to have some way to find my super fans, let them pay me, and then I want to reward them with interaction and with playing games with them. And we were like, awesome. How about a subscription program? And he was like, I mean, more or less, sounds great. And then we built it for him. Um, and it was a feature for one broadcaster, and it was massively successful. And then the incident showed up on his channel, all these other broadcasters started asking us, hey, why can't I have that too? 
Like, that's not fair. Why does only he have it? Then we had to go back and clean up a huge amount of technical debt because we built it in such a way that it could only be given to one broadcaster, uh, which was the absolute right thing to do because we found out whether it worked or not really fast. Um, and then we built it out for, for everyone, basically. Um, yeah, that was, a, that was a great program and a great example of why your users can identify areas for you to work in a lot better than you can. Yeah? Do you think there's application for like a large scale subscription model in video games? Is that something Twitch would be interested in, like a Netflix style subscription video game? Yeah, is there, a net, is there a room for a Netflix of video games? Lots of people have tried that. Um, people keep trying to build the Netflix of video games. Um, video games are very different from movies. Uh, you tend to play one or two video games really heavily at a time and then move on to the next one. And you, there, it is rare for you to want to actually cycle through lots of video games quickly. Um, and so it's really hard to make a global video game subscription work because the reason Netflix works is it, it, it encourages more consumption, basically. You get an all-you-can-eat buffet of movies, and since you can, the number of movies you watch is very flexible, it's easier for them to generate kind of a good deal by generating more consumption than they would have otherwise. Video games, by contrast, are very cheap per hour played. Um, and so it's hard to generate a good deal by, by bundling them up. Uh, I do think there's an opportunity for uh, more, of a, more subscription models in video games in general, but I don't think it's as straightforward as sort of bundling up a bunch of video games the way that, uh, the way that Netflix did for movies and TV shows. One more question? Yeah. yeah. So what kind of um, changes have there been from the Steam interface? Uh, like yeah. What's, what's changed since Amazon bought us? Uh, two big things. I never have to raise money again. And raising money is the worst. So that's awesome. And uh, we now have to deal with the fact that we're part of a larger company, uh, which adds, on the other side, friction around, you know, how do you figure out HR policy? How do you figure out entity creation in other countries? Lots of legal and administrative stuff where the standards for a large public corporation are different than the standards for a small private startup. Uh, so that's been a learning experience. Uh, but overall, really positive, uh, actually. Uh, I've, been, I've been pretty happy with the results. All right, awesome. Thank Sweet. You. Emmett, thank you so much. And uh, I don't have anything else for you guys because this is it. Uh, so thank you all for, those are great questions for Emmett. I thought he did an awesome job. And to all the speakers, thank you for coming to Penn State. Uh, for the liaisons that have been helping all the speakers, thank you guys. To our organizers, Pam, who uh, has done an incredible amount of work on this. I don't know where she is right now, probably working on the next thing. There she is. Thank you. And students, like I am excited to see all the great stuff that's coming out of Penn State. Um, I'm excited for whenever I come back here with like a cane in five years uh, to see you guys up here speaking about your startup success stories. So thank you so much, and uh, we are. Anybody who's still left, we are. Uh, I need all my students.